so the foundation is set and it's time to start framing on this episode of Built to Last, The Green Home. Support for Built to Last is provided by Unico Incorporated, manufacturers of the small duct high velocity HVAC Unico system. Unico is dedicated to the environment and has been serving residential and commercial customers around the corner and around the globe for more than 25 years. Great Northern Lumber, providing green construction materials from skyscrapers to residential remodel. Proud to serve you for the last 27 years and into the future in the lumber industry. Bosch, power tools for professionals. Proud sponsor of The Green Home. Florida Tile, expect more. SPI Incorporated, protective coatings, proven performance, and real-world solutions for 24 years. Additional funding is provided by these firms. So we're off to a good start with our foundation and basement slab in place. Today, we'll begin working on the structural elements of our home. So let's start framing. Yesterday we got started, the lumber was delivered on site. Uh, the carpenters are here. They're starting to mobilize. They're gonna do a layout of the basement walls, kind of snap the perimeter lines, get everything set. And uh, they'll start breaking down the lumber, take it down there and start laying out their walls for framing. We are gonna snap out and establish the perimeter of the, the building. We'll determine that everything is square or maybe not square, and we will make whatever adjustments need to be made. If something's off a half inch or an inch, we will adjust the wall accordingly, because at this stage of the game, we're not going to, we're not going to turn around and move a concrete wall. The lumber we're using is FSC rated lumber from the Forestry Stewardship Council. It's lumber that's harvested from forests that are ecologically monitored and uh, maintained. So basically it's not where they go in, cut down the lumber and the trees. They kind of do it in such a way that they try to sustain some of the older growth lumber, newer growth lumber, and kind of maintain what's being cut out. So this way, it's an ecological way. You're not inhibiting or displacing anything that's in the environment there. We have basically two carpenters working. You know, one's doing the framing and one, the other's doing the cutout and measuring. So it's a very efficient way of doing it. They're, they're really working pretty fast and it's a efficient crew and you can see from what they're doing, it's really gonna come together pretty quick. The framing that we're doing for this house is advanced framing for carpentry. The main difference is the stud spacing is 24 inches on center versus 16 inches on center. What we're doing is we're taking advantage of the properties of the wood, using them to their limits, which allows us to space the lumber 24 inches on center. Basically, we cut out about a third of the lumber. There's a cost savings there. We size the headers for the openings in lieu of just doing two by 12 headers everywhere for doors and windows. We're able to go down to two by sixes for smaller window and door openings. So we're not using excess of wood. It's a smart framing, it's smart techniques, it's the right way to do things. We're taking advantage of what the wood's designed for rather than just do things to for a sense of what's there. The wall will be assembled in pieces. We'll square the walls up on the ground. We will sheet them while they're laying down for the most part. And then we'll tip the walls up in place, brace them up with some two by bracing so the wind doesn't blow them over until uh, we get the steel set and the floor trusses in place, which will ultimately tie all of those lower level basement walls together.
After the frames are constructed and sheathed, our carpenters need just a little more manpower to tilt the exterior walls in place and make sure they are plumb, level, and securely braced. Once all the exterior basement walls are up and properly set and secured, it's time to bring in the steel that will support the levels above. We got a beautiful, hot, sunny day to install the steel, so it's a little warmer than it needs to be this time of year for early spring, but it's a good day. The conditions are dry, so the rain held off. They were able to get most of the framing in place yesterday. So at that point, we're ready to set the steel. We got our location set, our exterior walls are up, and we're getting ready to set it in today. Yeah, top of the steel is your top of the foundation. Our steel framing is the typical framing you would have for a basement. What we, what we tried to do is minimize the number of posts and beams we had in the house. We're able to incorporate most of them in the walls. Uh, our probably most critical dimension opening here is the stair openings. So based on that, they're able to shoot and locate everything. So we're pretty much within an inch of what our stair openings need to be, which is great. So just bringing all the trades together, knowing that everything's been monitored and is on target. Everything's lining up and working out great today. Now that our basement framing and I-beams are put in place, it's time to install the support for our main floor. Trusses are shipped in, and a crane helps our carpenters move them into place. Past couple days, we completed the framing of the exterior walls for the walkout basement. We've got our steel framing set in place, so they're ready to drop the trusses today. In this uh, house, we've got open web floor trusses. Basically, we're, the reason we're using those is kind of frees up the space in the basement, running all our piping and wiring through the open web area of the trusses. Kind of eliminates the need for soffits and drop ceiling areas. It takes advantage of the space. And what's nice about it, it's less material. Uh, we're going with the advanced framing. We're 24 on center, so we're able to span a little further using less material, less lumber. It's a very efficient way to do it. And it's strong. We have a strong floor. We'll have a sound system up there and it'll be work out great. After the floor trusses are spaced and set, the carpenters begin laying the subfloor. Caulk is applied before the subfloor system is laid down and fastened with nails. With the subfloor set, it's time to start framing our main level. The carpenters proceed in the same fashion as the basement level. Measurements are confirmed and lines are snapped out before our crew starts assembling and laying out the walls. Here on the basement level that we've seen go up during this episode, and I'm standing here with you, Look O'Reilly from Denk and Roche. How are you doing? Good, and yourself? Good, thanks. Good. You know, what I've been really impressed with is how efficient the process has been with just a few carpenters. Well, pretty much we like to get out here with just a couple of guys, get the majority of the work laid out and ready to get stuff built. At that point in time, we'll bring out extra manpower and that way everybody is pretty much putting stuff together, tipping walls up, and being as efficient as they can. Right, I was gonna say, we've got some walls up. Can you tell me what you're gonna be doing today? Well, the guys are gonna continue building the rest of the walls here on the first level, and 
They'll tip them up, brace them up, and we're trying to get ready for roof trusses coming the middle of next week. With the extra manpower and some mechanical support, our carpenters can now erect the walls they assembled in the days before. In just a few days, they have gotten the majority of external walls and internal framing in place, just in time to showcase our work in progress to some young minds eager to learn about green construction. Came out to the job site today, we got a lot of progress, a lot of things are completed, which is great. We see have some middle school children coming on site today to kind of see what goes into the construction of a home. And I'm excited about it because it's an opportunity to kind of express what is being done in the construction world and architectural world to con convey sustainable design and engineering and protect an environment. And it's a great opportunity for us to show them what goes on. These are ICFs, they're insulated concrete forms. I don't know if you guys seen these before, but basically it's like a styrofoam sandwich, the center's hollow, and then they pour concrete in there. And then what it does is that becomes your exterior wall and it gives you an insulating factor. So normally you come back and you put insulation on the exterior and interior. This is all done in one step basically. And they're like Lego blocks. They're 18 inches long and they snap together just like you would. And you build the wall up as high as you can. And it's an environmental thing. It gets the insulation value of the home. That's the foundation portion of the house. Since this is a walkout house, the site slopes, the rest of this just becomes frame construction. So as you would on a regular part of the house. These kids have been learning about green technologies throughout the year. By visiting our home site, they were getting the opportunity to see directly the applications of what they learned. I know some points come from your installation and like the heating, but where do the other ones come from? How do you add them all up? Our goal is to be a lead, lead platinum home, which is the highest rating you can get out of lead. But to do that, it's the minimum point barrier, I believe, is 108, and we have a couple strikes against us. LEED kind of gears towards homes that are 2,100 square feet, 2,200 square feet, three bedroom efficient homes. But since we have a criteria to build here, we have to be 2,500, our LEED requires you to be a percent above. So we have to achieve more points because we're building a larger home. So they raised the bar for everything. They figured if you're gonna build a larger home, you're gonna to have to make it energy efficient. So they want you to take more steps to achieve that goal. So at every aspect of the construction, the, from the foundation to the insulation under the slab, the slab, the radiant piping, everything that goes from the ground up is based on, you're able to achieve points for. And we're just trying to, in every category, we're trying to address and be conscientious of everything we can do that makes sense. You do things up front and you look at it over the long term. Things just don't happen overnight. It was a polite group of kids. They had some great questions, uh, had a keen interest in the project and what's being done. It'd be great to reach out to more and have more come out to see the project. Our wall framing is in place and our law framing is complete, so today we're ready to start installing the trusses. Based on the size and shape of this roof, it's kind of a complicated roof structure. Uh, it does lend itself to the use of trusses because of the open spans and a lot of the features we want to get into the home itself. Normally, it be, being stick frame, we would have some large members spanning the ridge beams, ridge, ridge rafters and other components that would be good sized lumber, very heavy, and doesn't take advantage of what we can do through trusses. Trusses kind of keep it a lightweight system. We use less material. We're able to get it done in a shorter time frame. And also with trusses, we allow for areas for running ductwork, mechanical, electrical, things through there where we have the voids, where we're not cutting through members, we're not furring down ceilings and things. And so we're taking advantage of what's in place there to kind of create a nice feature and space in the home itself. Roof trusses are fabricated off-site. Uh, it's a process where shop drawings are developed. 
the roof is divided into components, so everything is, the various members are sized and fabricated off-site to be shipped here. And we have drawings that show how everything's gonna go and assembled and be set in place. Sections that were too large to ship here as one unit are gonna be fabricated and assembled right outside the home here and will be lifted in place with the crane. There are a lot of smaller sections that are repetitive that were able to be trucked out as one unit and they're gonna be lifted into place as a unit. Some of those where they're smaller, over gables and dormers, they'll probably assemble four or six of the trusses together and lift them in place as one complete unit. The nice thing and interesting about these trusses, we're all two by four members. Uh, this lightweight members, the trusses are lightweight, but we're able to span at 24 inches on center. So we're able to span a big distance using lighter members of wood framing, and we still have the strength and resistance that we need for a roof and wall and ceiling framing. This is something that it's, a lot of people think it's more for repetition in homes. Obviously, we don't have a lot of repetition here. This is kind of a complicated roof structure, but trusses did lend themselves to this design of the home. So it's just knowing that and taking that, those steps necessary to explore this as an option is something that I think that more people should take an interest in doing. It uses less material, as material costs go up, these are solutions that are very reasonable, a way to approach the construction of a home. All the roof trusses are set in place, so today we're ready to start the sheathing. What they did is they loaded a lot of the sheathing material up onto the loft so it minimizes the amount of handling to get the roofing up there on top. So they should be ready to go and start getting the process started. Our sheathing system for the roof, it's composite of OSB, which is a recyclable product, so it's great. We get some lead points for that. But also, it has an impregnated coating on top that's an air barrier. So what that does, it eliminates the use of felt paper. So once we get the sheathing on, we're able to tape the joints and we ha have a house that's going to be weather tight and airtight. So we can sit up to 120 days being exposed to the elements and the house will be watertight. So we're obviously we're not going to be leaving it for that period of time, but until we can get everything ready and set, at least we don't have to worry about doing any precautions to keep the rest of the house dry. We have some pretty extreme roof pitches on our house here, so obviously safety is a big factor. So everybody involved working on the roofing, they have a safety harness, they're tied off, and you know obviously nobody's going to go out beyond reaches where they can handle. So uh, everybody's pretty conscientious of what can be done and what the uh, requirements are here for safety. Once all our sheathing is in place, the next things we'll probably be doing is we'll be roughing in for any penetrations through the roof. Uh, we'll be getting the roof prepped for gutters and fascia and trim and just trying to get that house ready to be buttoned up. Once we have all our penetrations through the roof, including our vent pipes and our skylights, we'll be ready for roofing. I am here to take a look at uh, just the general overall uh, structural framing um, before they start uh, closing everything up. Um, so I'm looking at the wall studs, the headers, the, there's some steel beams and columns. Um, just making sure everything looks like uh, we designed it. This was a very complicated roof. There's a lot of uh, volume spaces and uh, some pretty interesting uh, truss configurations and, and it looks good and the carpenters did a great job. Talked to Bruce, we walked through the the um, house and we just wanted to make every make sure everything was okay before they move on to the next step. Uh, the framing looks good and I, I think they're ready. In a building using the, the framing techniques that we have here, one of the primary things is to make sure all the framing uh, is in alignment. Um, all the trusses uh, have to align directly over the wall studs. Um, I'm also looking for the connection hardware used to make sure it's uh, what was specified on the plans, whether it's a, uh, a beam hanging off of another beam or a, a truss getting tied down to the top of the wall. In my everyday work, I see a lot more front-end concern about sustainability and building green. And with the, the framing techniques used here, uh, you accomplish that. 
We made the most efficient use of the wood that we can. Uh, we saved a lot of the cutoffs. They're used to frame out the soffit framing, a few things like that. But what can't be used are odd shapes and things that are more of scrap. The remnants are put in a dumpster. Dumpster's taken off site and all the material will be sorted so it doesn't end up in the landfill. So we try to make the most efficient use of the materials we can. The crew just pulled away, completed the day. It's been a couple of hot days here, so uh, especially to be doing sheathing and framing. So we've got everything completed and we're moving ahead. Oh, hey, hi, Lorene. You here to check out our progress? Oh, yeah, Bruce. So far, so good. Just checking to make sure the headers are sized according um, to the loads and that we've got California corners and that sort of fun stuff. There's one, actually four areas overall that I'm a little concerned with, like the skylights. Okay. So if you wanted to sure. take a quick look. It comes back to that issue of are we going to spray the underside of the sheathing or are we going to do the just the ceiling of the attic? Or should I say the floor of the attic? And this might be one of those areas where we just say to heck with it and we spray the underside of sheathing because it's just going to be very difficult to get all the little nooks and crannies around that skylight. Sure. Sure. So, but that we might have different instances depending on sure. where the skylights are located. Sure. Absolutely. Okay. As I walk through with Lorene, a lot of the issues that she was pointing out that we have to address or could be concerns are insulation. We've got a lot of areas between roof trusses and a different type of framing that is going to lend itself to different types of insulation. So we're going to probably be doing a combination of systems in order to maintain an insulated value of the home. So those are things we're going to have to work out as we progress through it. I did notice we had a little extra framing underneath the window. Is this because structural? Yes, yeah, structurally this okay. wall is a load bearing wall. Mm -hmm, right. So it's bringing the roof load down. So we do have a little more framing in here. So. Okay. And I know there were a couple spots out here at the bay. Kind of how the sheathing came together because of the angles of the corner. I know we had some gaps in there. Right. So like here they'll probably have to retape. We do have another layer of one inch rigid insulation that's going to be going over the entire perimeter oh. of the house. So. Well, as long as we do that, tape that, and wrap it with the, uh, the protective barrier, I think we should be all right. Great. Everything should be good to go? Yeah, I think so. Passed? <laughs> For another day? For today. <laughs> okay, great. Our home is framed and sheathed, and Bruce and Laureen got a chance to review the home's progress. Now it's time for Laureen to weigh in on our home's green plan. Well, so far we're doing really well. We're making excellent progress within the program. And I like the fact that you know, we've achieved many of the framing efficiencies that we originally set out to do. We're using open wet floor joists. And interestingly enough, we were able to achieve our stud spacing, ceiling joists, floor joists, and roof rafters six, above 16 inches on center. In fact, we're actually 24 inches on center, which is good because then we have less thermal bridging. And then we were able to do at least two special framing efficiencies. We're sizing the headers for specific loads, as well as doing two stud corners so we can get extra insulation in those, uh, those areas. And then there is a bit of a effect with using the FSC certified wood with the exterior framing and the interior framing, so we'll definitely be able to get, pick up some points in the materials and resources category. There's also a cascade effect on the energy and atmosphere and indoor environmental quality because we have less framing, we have less thermal bridging, and consequently we have a more energy efficient home or has the ability to perform better. There's also a coating on the exterior sheathing that acts as an air barrier, which also has this effect on the energy and atmosphere. And then the indoor environmental quality, because we have ure urea formaldehyde-free products, both for the floor sheathing and for the exterior sheathing, as well as the roof sheathing, we won't have any effect from that particular product on the indoor environmental quality of the home. So overall, I, I think we're doing good, and uh, I'm looking forward to the next opportunity to give you an update. Now that our framing and sheathing are complete, you can see our home is really starting to take shape. On the next episode of Built to Last, we'll put systems in place to keep the weather out and the comfort in. See you then. Visit the Built to Last website to learn about these topics and more.
Support for Built to Last is provided by Unico Incorporated, manufacturers of the small duct high velocity HVAC Unico system. Unico is dedicated to the environment and has been serving residential and commercial customers around the corner and around the globe for more than 25 years. Great Northern Lumber, providing green construction materials from skyscrapers to residential remodel. Proud to serve you for the last 27 years and into the future in the lumber industry. Bosch, power tools for professionals. Proud sponsor of The Green Home. Florida Tile, expect more. SPI Incorporated, protective coatings, proven performance, and real-world solutions for 24 years. Additional funding is provided by these firms.